This is the Skin in the Game VC podcast, hosted by Tom Wallace, entrepreneur turned venture capitalist and the managing partner at Florida Funders, along with Saxon Baum, general partner and head of investor relations at Florida Funders. You'll learn from the best about investing in early stage tech companies, so you too can gain the confidence and find the tools that help you succeed as an angel investor. Are you ready to get some skin in the game? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Skin in the Game pod. Uh, my name is Saxon Baum. I'm a partner at Florida Funders, heading up investor relations. Uh, we have a great guest here today, a little bit different than our typical guest, uh, not an entrepreneur, and I would say not a venture investor from a primary standpoint, but definitely a venture investor, and we're going to get into that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, our guest today the CIO, Chief Investment Officer of University of Miami, Charmel Menard. Charmel, thank you for being here today. Jackson, thanks so much for having me on. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Absolutely. And you have a very interesting role because you are a professional investor, um, but you're not investing typically directly into companies. Can you talk a little bit about um, what your role is at the University of Miami? Uh, and then we're going to double click on that and talk about how you got to where you are, what you're looking for and those types of things. But just the overall role, what's your what's your day to day? Yeah, sure. So uh, as you as you mentioned, uh, I'm the university's chief investment officer and treasurer. Uh, so I really wear two hats at the university. The first one is as treasurer. So that's uh, a typical treasury role. So, you know, managing the university's billion eight capital structure. So the university issues debt to help fund strategic growth, such as uh, new dorms, new hospitals, so on and so forth, making sure the bank, uh, bank accounts are open or closed and making sure that the cash is in the right accounts to pay Uncle Sam, so on and so forth. Uh, the second hat I, I, I wear, which is more pertinent to this conversation, perhaps, is as chief investment officer. So uh, I'm in charge of investing all the university's investable assets. So that's a little bit over $4 billion, and it's spread across three different pools of capital. The first one is our endowment. Uh, that's one I think we'll probably double click on a little bit more. Uh, the second one is our defined benefit pension plan. So that is close to new participants, but they're actively uh, earning benefits. So there is uh, a lot of liability management that has to go on there. And then there's our short-term working capital, which essentially is a university's uh, cash. So three pools of capital, three distinct end goals and missions. Uh, and we and we manage all three pools differently. Uh, but, you know, for, for, for this conversation at Preventure, we generally focus most on, on the endowment. So from a day-to-day -day standpoint, it really depends. You know, there's some years where the university is issuing a bond, and I have to focus a little bit more on that. Uh, but I'd say for the most part, it's probably a 60-40 split between uh, the investing side versus the treasury side. Awesome. No, I appreciate that rundown. And the University of Miami has one of the larger endowments in the state of Florida. Uh, can you talk about how you got into this current position? Um, first off, you're much younger than most other CIOs of universities that I've spoken with. So want to understand a little bit about that, how you got into this role. Uh, what was your background before this? Did it lend into what you're doing now? Was it good luck? Was it hard work? Tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, sure. Happy to. So, so I think, you know, you, you touched on one of the words. It's a little bit of luck, a little bit of preparation. Um, and what I was doing before, which I'll, which I'll touch on, I'm not sure people would generally say that it was directly applicable, but I can tell you, you know, how and why I think it prepared me really well for, for this current role. So, you know, prior to this role, so I've been at the university for about eight years. I've been in this, in this seat of CIO and treasurer for about seven of those eight years. Um, uh, I, I did investment banking. So I worked at JP Morgan for, um, almost 10 years doing leveraged finance, which essentially is helping um, private equity shops or, or corporations raise debt for um, leverage buyouts for mergers and acquisitions, general corporate purposes. Uh, and as part of that, there was a lot of, uh, of diligence, right? You have to really diligence the credit, really di diligence the company. Where are the weak spots? Where do I need to know? And, you know, it's one thing to know everything about the company, but more importantly, a lot of the time, it's, it's, it's learning what you don't know uh, about the company, what questions you have to ask. So uh, I transferred to the university when I was about 31 years old. 
And my predecessor ended up uh, leaving about a year in. So as you alluded to, I was, I was 32 years old when I was appointed CIO and treasurer, which, you know, according to my knowledge, at least, it was, it was by far the youngest CIO across the country. I think it's probably uh, pretty definitely safe one to of say a handful. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, there, there's... Um, there, there are a couple other one, young ones now, but definitely at the time in, in, in 2017, uh, I, I agree with you, Saxon. So, um, you know, so, so a little about what was right place at the right time. And, and, and two was having a mentor and a sponsor really build me up to say, hey, if I leave, Charmel can handle this. And they took him to heart. He, you know, he, he left for, for various reasons. And the board and executive leadership looked to me and said, hey, uh, your apparently is heir apparent, so it's your ship now. And you know whether or not I was I, I was ready or not. That that's a whole other conversation. But um, you know I asked a lot of questions, and and I think things have been going all right so far. But you know going back to how did investment banking prepare me for this role? And you touched on this earlier, Saxon. You know we invested managers, right? Our our whole um, goal is to go find the best managers within various asset classes and strategies. And uh, as fiduciaries, give them and commit money uh, and let them hopefully compound that money for us, which benefits the university, our students, research, so on and so forth. So the diligence is slightly different than if you were investing directly, which is what basically I was uh, I was doing diligence on specific companies. But diligencing a, 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 a manager is, is very similar. Right. So I would come from this debt background where. You are trying to get in every nook and cranny of a company, try to, you know, as I call it, box the risk, like what could go wrong? And that was directly applicable to diligencing managers, right? And more importantly, was me understanding, okay, well, what do I not know? So as I mentioned, I came from a debt world. If I'm if I'm now diligencing a public equity manager, which I was not as familiar with, you know, I knew to go ask, you know, our investment you know, consultant, go ask my peers, okay, if these are the 10 questions I would ask a debt manager, what else am I missing um, if these aren't directly applicable. And I think because I, you know, I understood that I didn't know everything, uh, the first year, first, you know, first two years, I got the learning curve really quickly by just, you know, being comfortable with the fact that I knew I'm not going to know everything and I'm going to go ahead and ask people, what are these things I'm missing? So, um, I, I felt like it was directly applicable. The second thing was, you know, as part of investment banking, you're really telling a story, right? So you're taking large, quantities of information, of, of quantitative information, you're distilling it into a couple of slides, and then you're going to talk to clients about, hey, I think you should do X, Y, or Z. This is the story of how you got from point A to point B. And it's a very similar discussion that when I'm having uh, uh, our investments committee that I'm, I'm conveying this to our investments committee. So being able to distill, you know, 40 plus managers uh, all across the globe that have, you know, several different strategies into a handful of slides and say, hey, investments committee at University of Miami, this is how we are doing. These are the, this is the attribution to our performance. These are the detractors. This is what's going well. This is not what's going well. Uh, I think all those things plus a lot more really prepared me for the job. So that that's a great point around the, the process that you guys have, because the process that an institutional investor or an institutional manager like you guys have compared to us as you know a, a primary investor is, is much different. When you started, did they already have a, a great process in place that you then adopted, or did you bring fresh new ideas and really implement your own process uh, at, at the endowment level? Yeah, no, th this is one of the most fun parts of my job, Saxon, is you know, our board brought myself and my predecessor in uh, to completely revamp the investment office and process at the University of Miami. Uh, but, so to answer your question directly, so we did not have a great process before, and that was one of the that was one of the things that we worked on. So you know, we changed um, our investment consultant, we changed custodians, we re rewrote all of our investment policy statements, redid asset allocation. When all was said and done, we probably overturned eighty percent of the assets. So this. This portfolio, you know, call it portfolio 2.0, is 100% this team and administration's fingerprints on it. So you talked about, yes, I'm not an entrepreneur, but this is actually one of the things I really love most about this job is that I was able to build a brand new investment program inside of an established organization, which is very rare. You know, if you go to one of these other uh, investment offices that have been operating for hundreds of years, you kind of step into something that's probably been working. And if it hasn't been working, they probably have best practices in place. This was sort of brand new. And so we got to revamp 
how we think about um, selecting managers, how do we think about diligence and managers, how do we think about risk, how do we think about technology, uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of the things I really enjoy most. And, you know, eight years in, uh, seeds that we planted in 2016 are now coming to fruition. And it's as a long-term investor, that's really, really cool to see that, you know, the vision that you had or, or, or the take that you had that could take 10, 15 years Hopefully you get to sit here and, and, and see it come to fruition. I, I love that story. And it reminds me a lot of my story of Florida Funders. When I started, um, the firm was established already, but really it was it was a startup in and of itself. So I came from running a business, then going over to the investing side, and I felt like I was still able to uh, be an entrepreneur and, and put my own stamp on our investor relations and on our process and our procedure. So that story resonates with me very well. Uh, I want to go into kind of the core of the conversation around venture capital. I heard a podcast that you did, uh, the 10X podcast, which is a great pod. If nobody's listened, I would encourage you specifically if you're a venture manager. Uh, but you guys talked about venture capital and how this was an asset class that the university uh, typically shied away from a little bit. So I'd love to get your thoughts as an institutional manager. How are you thinking about venture capital um, from an overall, you know, just asset class? How are you guys thinking about it? How does it play into your strategy as a whole? Yeah, sure. I mean, we 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 love venture. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, we are brand new to venture, brand new and relatively relative to our peers. We, we've been actively investing in venture probably for like the last five years or so. Prior to that, we had a whopping zero percent invested in venture for a confluence of reasons. But the most important important part is that we are here now and and, and we do love it. You know, at the beginning of uh, uh, of us starting to learn more about venture, we really tried to to dive deep into the industry, look at what's the mission, what's the purpose, um, what are the risk st uh, statistics, who are the players in the game. As I mentioned before, I was a little bit more uh, familiar with buyout funds, with private equity funds. I was not as familiar with with venture. So, uh, like a lot of New Yorkers do when they move to a new new city and say, "Okay, well, where's the Soho? Where's?" Where's the Upper East Side? Where's the Upper West Side? I try to do something similar, right? Who's the KKR? Who's the Carlisle? Yep. And that took probably a year of sort of digging in and trying to figure out, does this asset class strategy have a place within the University of Miami's asset allocation framework? And the and, and, the, and the answer was uh, resoundingly yes, right? We, we are a comprehensive research university that has a large academic medical center attached to it. Um, Research is one of the core pillars of the university. Why would we not be also investing our dollars in, in new technology, people who are trying to make um, and change the world for the better? So we thought one from a, from a mission alignment standpoint, it, it, it definitely aligned. The second part was, okay, do we think that there are attractive risk-adjusted returns um, to help contribute to the university's overall uh, performance? And again, the answer was yes. Look, we don't you know, put the same uh, checks as, as we would do with a, with a public equity manager, but, you know, you adjust things up and down. And uh, I always say, and we talked to my, our team about this, is we want access or exposure to companies through all stages of its life, right? So if I did a reverse, we had large cap buyout exposure, right? So mega cap companies, uh, we had public equity exposure uh, for, for companies who have IPO'd and who are growing, but then we also had, you know, middle market, smaller companies within our middle market buyout funds. And then, you know, we wanted to get, you know, as we went down and down the spectrum, growth equity exposure, you know, multi-strategy, venture exposure, and then, you know, ultimately early stage pre-seed seed exposure as well when, when, the, when, the, when the idea is just um, being worked on. And so, as you can imagine, if you think about that spectrum, you know, pre-seed seed is probably the smallest allocation within our, our private equity uh, going up to growth equity, which is probably the, the larger relative commitment. But we we really like to have exposure to the best companies at every stage of this world. And, and, and venture uh, really enables us to, to have that exposure. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And that's where I was going to go next around asset allocation. This is, there's not a go-to formula. There's not a, hey, this is the standard around asset allocation. It's really different per university, per endowment, per pension fund, per risk tolerance um, for that that investing team. When you guys think about venture, and, and you can 
couple of venture altogether, not just early stage, but all of venture capital. How do you guys think about that from an asset allocation number? Is it sub 10, above 10, sub five? How are you guys thinking about that venture allocation? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think you, you you nailed it, Saxon. Every university, every endowment, every investment office is going to be different based on what that individual organization needs. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. So uh, University of Miami, our endowment spending distribution um, only constitutes about uh, 1% of our operating budget, right? We have about a $5 billion operating budget, and that's really driven because we have a large, large health system, as I touched on before. Um, whereas like my alma mater, Amherst College, their endowment spending distribution uh, represents about 60% of their operating budget, give, give or take a couple percentage points. So what does that mean? Are you less risky or, or, or more risky in, a, in an endowment that constitutes more? In theory, you're going to be less risky, yep. right? So in theory, we could be more risk on because, you know, there's less impact on the organization. Yeah, if, if something goes um, wrong, the university is not going to go under. It, it, that's exactly right. Yeah. So um, so let me just start with that. So for us, our overall private equity budget is about 12%. Okay. That is relatively low compared to our peers, which are probably – closer to, to, to mid 20s. And this is something that we've been working on. We've been slowly, deliberately and gradually growing that. When I started in 2016, we were probably 1%. Now we're up to 12%. And within that private equity uh, portfolio, we target around 30 to 40% venture uh, and then the rest going into buyout. So it, it, it is it is a large portion of the private equity, but it's also not um, it is not the, the, the majority of that, again, and that really just goes back to sort of risk adjusted returns uh, and what we need as a university um, in terms of what our target is. And our, and our mission and our goal is one, to meet the university spending needs, which is about four and a half percent. That's sort of the mandated um, spending distribution calculation that we need to distribute back to the university every year. And then we need to protect against inflation or, or preserve our purchasing power, which uh, as we can all appreciate the last couple of years, that's been hard to beat, right? Yep, inflation's course. been crazy. Yeah. Uh, but over a long period of time, that's anywhere between seven and a half to eight percent. So we're not trying to target 15% returns, right? We're trying to target, you know, around 8% with the least amount of risk that, that that's needed. Um, and so that's sort of why we're not, you know, 50%, 60% in venture. Um, it's just not needed in our asset allocation framework right now. Well, and the other interesting thing that you mentioned is you guys are long-term investors and venture capital is a long-term investment. So it, it probably matches up to your point very well with your guys' strategies, not needing immediate liquidity and only having it be, you know, call it uh, four or 5% of the total asset allocation. The one thing that I wanted to ask you is around diligence, because we as Florida funders and most other venture capital funds, um, they operate fairly similar. I mean, there's the intricacies and there's there's differentiating factors that in a due diligence process do set funds apart. But we're looking for great founders, especially as early as we're investing, you know, in the seed early A, looking for great founders, looking for a great team, looking for some sort of product market fit, and then running calculations around total addressable market and those types of things. But that's on individual companies. What are some of the factors and some of the metrics that you guys look at when diligencing a manager um, that our managers that are listening today, you know, they could they could take away from this conversation? Yeah, sure. Look, I, I, I think in this current environment, you've probably heard this a lot, Saxon, you know, the returning of cash to, to LPs has been, you know, one of the key metrics that we've looked at. D does the firm have a history of returning capital to the LPs or do they hold on too long? Do they hold on too short? Um, and, and what is that mindset, right? Because I, I think it's it's difficult and it shows discipline on the manager's um, part to to have something that's sitting there is maybe a, a 5, 7, 10x on the portfolio and the TVPI looks great, but, uh, you know, does it make sense to take, you know, two turns off the table, right, and distribute some capital, you know, understanding that there's probably still some value to extract or do you, are you the type that says, hey, you know, we're holding on for dear life and, um, you know, whatever happens, happens. I think for us as an institutional investor, someone who's new to the venture space, we prefer prefer someone who's a little bit more disciplined in terms of returning capital. 
Now, that can be difficult in, in situations where it's a newer fund and we don't do many newer funds uh, because, as we all know, and you touch on it, you know, venture is a very long term game. It can take 10, 12, 15 years to to see some of these companies come to fruition, especially on the earlier stage side. Um, but we're patient. Right. And, and in those in instances, we're really trying to figure out um, what is the manager's um, ability to, to to pick good companies, because. We are agnostic to to vintages. We're not trying to time the market. Once we found a dance partner, we want to dance with that part person all night long, no matter what the genre is. So we understand that you know some vintages are going to be way better than others, and that we are hiring that that manager to invest in the best possible companies for that market. Right? We don't want someone to hold back money. We don't want someone to 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 wait it out. Uh, we, we want them to go out there and find the best companies. And that might be an overvalued or I don't want to say overvalued, but a high valuation environment might be a low um, valuation environment, might be high interest rate environment, low interest rates, so on and so forth. So I say a lot to say is we do a lot of diligence into the actual underlying companies of the portfolio. That's what I was going to ask these you companies, Are you diving yeah. into the actual portfolio? Yeah, certainly. Yes, got it. Love that. Certainly, right? We want to see, because look, the, the valuation may have been, $80 million when you invested and they just did around at 50, right? Most people be like, oh, down around, whatever. But if that company is continuing to grow at 30% a year, 40% a year, whatever it might be, whatever you underwrote it to, then, you know, that that in our mind means you, you made a good pick, right? You, you, you're picking solid companies. Um, and so an environment like this is really difficult to diligence because, you know, in the past, everyone's IRR looked great because, because portfolios were marked up. But, you know, are you actually uh, picking good companies? And that's one of the other big metrics that we look for. We're obviously looking at, um, you know, uh, risk and how and how you think about check sizes. So, you know, a fund that may have their number one returner, right? It might be, at least on paper, might be a 15X. Did you put a large check into that or, or a larger check than usual? Or did you build up a larger position? Yeah. Or is that your smallest check? Because that also shows us, well, you didn't have conviction in your best investment. Uh, versus, you know, your largest check might have been, a, you know, a 2x or a 1x or whatever it might be. So, you know, little things like that matter to us and are good signals to us, like um, in terms of, of picking managers. But I'd say going back to the original point, you know, returning capital and actually having uh, some of these investments come to fruition, whether that's, you know, through whatever the liquidity event is, is probably the king in terms of metrics at these times. And that's obviously been over the last several years, that's been a challenge inside of venture capital. To your point, you see very high TVPI, very high MOIC or multiple on invested capital or IRR numbers, but a lot of those are unrealized gains. Uh, the metric that you know we're talking about here is called DPI or distributions paid in. How much money have you actually gotten back? These are long funds, we know that, but ultimately, it doesn't matter what the paper says. It matters how much money these funds have returned. The other thing that I wanted to understand from you is there's a there's a trend inside of venture capital that we're seeing that a lot of funds are maybe spinning off from their general fund to do smaller funds focused on specific verticals such as AI, such as e-com, uh, or you have managers that are leaving you have individuals inside of funds that are leaving, partner level people leaving, to start funds that are specific to those you know, specific industry verticals. Are you guys taking more of a generalist approach, looking at more generalist funds? Or are you guys getting a little bit more granular in terms of your strategy, looking for industry and vertical specific funds? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, Saxon. Thank you. I, for us and where we are in our program, we've taken more of a generalist view. Okay. Um, you know, at, at, at an endowment size of about a billion seven and so uh, or so, you know, having uh, industry and vertical specific managers is, is difficult. And, and I'll say uh, the other thing that's difficult about it is it, it is tough to figure out if that industry of vertical is going to be sustainable. Right. So we, again, want to be with managers who are going to be here for the long, haul, long haul. They, they're building great organization, great firms that will be, you know, fund eight, nine, 10, so on and so forth or more. And, you know, you see some of those and you touched on it, some of these firms are spinning up or, or doing small sidecar funds that that are very, very um, industry specific. So you said AI, there was obviously a lot of blockchain funds yep. a couple of years ago. And it, it, it is for, again, for where we are in our program, it is still too early to say, okay, we want to invest in this one firm because they may not be fund two, fund three, fund four, uh, for all we know, and I don't have a crystal ball, but you know what we like about the generalist approach is 
as I mentioned, we're trying to find the, the, the best investors within their strategies. And if, you know, fund X says this fund, we're going to be 50% AI because that's where we think the best value is. And, you know, the next fund is going to be only 10%. You know, we want to give the manager that ability to, to, to flex where they think they're going to find the best value versus having a completely different sidecar um, and having to piece together a bunch of different industry verticals to, you know, to make sort of a Frankenstein fund. So we prefer to just be in a generalist, uh, generalist manager and let them, let them pick where they're, where the real maps are going to lead them. Well, and also to your point, I mean, there's something to be said for funds that are very specific to what they're doing. But if, if you're looking at one vintage, that fund might do very well. You know, if you invested in a, in a blockchain fund that was in the early 2010s, you probably did very well. If you invest in a blockchain fund that was a 2020 vintage, probably are not doing so well. So completely understand where you guys are coming with that around sort of spreading spreading the assets across. Uh, do you guys hold any crypto on the balance sheet? So we don't hold any crypto on our balance sheet. We do have some very, very... Um, limited exposure to crypto or blockchain managers, okay. uh, but we, we but but the university hasn't yet um, allowed me to, to to put some Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Although uh, it's, it's not for lack of trying, but um, <laughs> you know I, I think where where we are right now it might, might take a couple more years of uh, of seeing Bitcoin hit you know hit all time highs, which obviously it did a couple weeks ago. It's the old crawl, walk, run, right? We don't just want to jump into the deep end here trying to put Ethereum and Bitcoin on the balance sheet. We're getting the venture strategy put in place first. Exactly, as you know, as my grandmother used to say, "Slow motion is better than no motion." So, so we're not in a Love rush. That. We'll be here for a while, and um, you know, these things take some time, but but we'll get there hopefully at some point. Awesome. Uh, I want to wrap up by discussing Miami. Uh, we're obviously huge proponents of the Miami ecosystem, not just technology, but the food scene. Um, the hospitality scene, the people. I mean, there, there's, in my opinion, no better place in the world right now than Florida. And then when you come to Florida, I really think Miami and Tampa are, are you know, one and two that I would say. And um, I want to double click on that piece. What are you excited about in the future of the Miami ecosystem? And it doesn't have to be technology, but what are you excited about uh, in the years to come in, in Miami? Yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, first of all, let me just say that the growth in Miami since I moved here eight years ago has been uh, been amazing. And where did right? you and, come and, from, Charmel, just so that we... Yeah, I came from New York. Okay, so I was in New it. York for Got 10 it. years before Got moving it. here. And so the growth in everything you said, Saxon, I mean, just the restaurant scene has, has just grown to an amazing level. I'd argue that we have, you know, we, well, we definitely do have Michelin star restaurants and, and cool, cool, cool places and speakeasy and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'd say that the, the, the quality of people has continued to improve, uh, which is great. Just people doing really interesting stuff and choosing Miami as their home base, whether or not their, their organization or, or their project is in Miami. They're just saying, I choose a better lifestyle, which, which Miami can generally, uh, can generally offer. And then now what you're seeing, what I'm really excited about is, you know, I'd say that, that the first wave, you know, in venture was called, you know, the crypto and blockchain wave. Yeah. And then sort of the, the, the more expansive sort of venture scene came here. And then now you're seeing broader finance, right? You're seeing hedge funds, you're seeing private equity shops. Um, and I'm hoping that the next wave is, is, is corporations, right? So you, you see a headline like a Jeff Bezos moving down here, you know, it would be phenomenal for, for, for South Florida or for Florida in general if Amazon was down here, right? And other corporations. And I think, you know, just seeing the, 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 the growth in the ecosystem in general for jobs, um, you know, for, for bringing talent into, into Miami slash Florida, I think it's only going to continue to grow as people sort of look around their life and say, hey, do I want to live in a place that, you know, is cold, you know, for, for six months out of the year or nine months of the year. Do it's I as want easy to live as in a that. Place that <laughs> That's how you get people right, that, right Do I want to live in, 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 in a very, very small apartment, right, with, with, with a kid and, and a family, um, you know, things like that. And I think we're starting to offer that. I think we're probably really early, early, Saxon. I, I would love to hear your view as well. I think we're like in the third inning, mm -hmm. right, of a nine inning sort of outing. Um, but 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 that one to three was was greatly accelerated um, through COVID, 
you know, I would say that might have taken us 10, 15 years to do it. So it'll be interesting to see where, you know, innings three to seven is going to take us and how long that's going to be. But I think we're really early and I think we're we're, we're just getting started. I, I couldn't agree more in the sense of we always talk about this COVID just absolutely accelerated the growth of the, the state of Florida from really every facet. For us, we were put in a really nice position, sort of being the organic Florida fund, and we invest all over the country, but putting our roots in Tampa and Miami, being that Florida fund, we were really the recipient of great technology talent and of great later stage investors that moved down to Miami uh, and gave us the opportunity to either invest in their companies and or bring our companies to them, like a Founders Fund, like a SoftBank, like a Coast Law, which we've done deals with now, so I couldn't agree more. We're early in the game. Uh, my biggest concern, I would say, around the Miami ecosystem is just infrastructure. You know, it's it's becoming not as easy as it was to get around, you know, so I think that there are some infrastructure problems. And Kathy Wood spoke at our event about two weeks ago. She said the same thing about Tampa and St. Pete. And I think that she's right. You know, we've just seen this astronomical growth. We're adding over a thousand people per day to the population. Uh, and to be able to sustain that growth, you need infrastructure. So hopefully things like the Bright Line coming to Tampa, connecting the rest of the state is going to help. Uh, I know that there's some very large infrastructure projects happening uh, simultaneously. So I think the future, no pun intended, is very bright for the state of Florida, for technology, for money managers, and for finance as a whole, and continue to provide that amazing uh, quality of life and standard of living. The last thing I wanted to ask you is uh, any companies specific in Miami um, that are being built in Miami that you're very excited about? Yeah, I mean, look, I I think we we have a couple of, of of phenomenal businesses already down here. You know, you you have the ramps of the world, uh, you have the papas of the world, uh, you know, the quick nodes of the world. I mean, th these are all companies that are either you know multi unicorn status or, or or very close. And I think you know those are some of the things where you know I know the founders personally, um, and and the things that they're working on is sort of life changing. Is it, it's it's helping businesses um, be more efficient, save costs. Um, and so those are just a couple of the ones that, that I know off the top of my head, and, and I'm sure there's a handful more uh, that I've heard about. But those are sort of the three that, that, that pop out of my mind that I'm really excited for, and I'm really happy that they call Miami home. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and we love to call Florida as a whole home, but Miami as well. Um, Charmel, thank you so much. I just want to say, I think that the University of Miami is in good hands with you uh, behind the helm. So we're excited to see, you know, you bringing more venture, institutional venture to the state of Florida. Um, we could not be happier to have you on the pod today. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, if you don't subscribe as a listener at this point, please go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. And we'll see you next time with another great guest. Charmel, thank you so much again. Thanks so much, Saxon. Really appreciate it and really had a great time. Awesome. Thanks for spending your time with Skin in the Game VC today. If you want to learn more about investing in early stage tech like a venture capitalist, be sure to visit the Florida Funders website at floridafunders.com. Join our angel network at no cost and get access to Florida Funders VC vetted investment opportunities in the next great breakout tech companies.